All right, welcome everybody. Appreciate your time today. Um, we will be uh, discussing how to build a winning cybersecurity program um, based on the cybersecurity maturity model certification uh, put out by DOD. Uh, my name is Cliff Neve. I'll be going through uh, how to build this winning program. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to email or call at any point in time. A little bit about myself. I'm an owner and chief operating officer with Mad Security. Been doing IT and IT security for over 26 years. I concluded my 20 years as a Coast Guard officer by standing up Coast Guard Cyber Command, where I worked with DHS, FBI, NSA, and U.S. Cyber. I did some time at the White House as deputy CIO. I have a technical background with uh, with some master's degrees and, and uh, certifications. And uh, Dave Stewart will be my co-host today. So, Dave. Hey, hey everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Stewart. I'm the Director of Cyber Risk and Compliance at Matt Security. Um, I've uh, kind of been around the block, as, as I say. I've, I've been in uh, uh, multiple DOD um, agencies like uh, uh, the Missile Defense Agency, Art, Army Aviation, and also NASA. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, 20 plus years experience in this field of, of building cybersecurity programs, running operations, and, um, and I've been with Matt Security for about uh, four or five years now. I'm looking forward to uh, going through this webinar with, with you all. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. um, a quick note about compliance and security. Compliance does not equate to security and vice versa. So today we'll be addressing both. Uh, some of you will only want to be um, interested in addressing compliance. That's your call. But you should really be aware of your risks and understand what, you're, uh, what kind of risks you're taking by just addressing compliance. Whereas Compliance is viewed as a cost center. Security is viewed as a strategic idea uh, and, and a board of directors type requirement. And frequently by just being, um, taking some time to get organized, you can achieve both uh, rather easily as opposed to just a checklist approach to things. So I wanted you all to be aware of that up front of the difference between those two because it's a huge differentiator. For orientation, here are the eight steps to building a winning cybersecurity program, and I'll be presenting these in the same order that they're shown here. Having seen hundreds of organizations, I feel these steps are applicable regardless of size or vertical. If I were to come into any organization as a chief information security officer, these steps would serve as my roadmap for getting that organization secure and compliant and ready to roll. So the very first step is that somebody needs to be accountable. Uh, how many organizations have one person that is ultimately in charge of cybersecurity? Um, another question, you know, how many of you have boards or executive leaders who champion cybersecurity? So every successful cybersecurity program uh, that, that I've ever been witness to uh, has someone clearly designated, empowered, and willing to be responsible, who's backed up by the board and the CEO to actually make things happen. One person, not a group, not an oligarchy, but one person who's actually responsible and accountable to the board and CEO for security. And that accountability comes from the top down. And the buck needs to stop with an executive, uh, which is why I've got my uh, picture of Truman up here. Um, it'll come into play later when we talk about policy enforcement, it's extremely difficult to enforce policies and makes them useless if you don't have somebody who has the power to be able to enforce them. Um, the second step is to understand what the requirements are and to know what you're defending. So knowing what you're defending starts with understanding your business processes. And I've heard these called different things throughout my career. Sometimes they're called your mission, your organizational characteristics, or just your business. The reason you invest in cybersecurity is to enable your mission and to protect your assets. So you begin with documenting your critical business functions, conducting your business impact analysis, and understanding how information and information systems enable them. In some industries, downtime can lead to injuries or death such as a hospital, such as uh, many times operational technology or industrial control systems. Um, and availability 
seems to be a very forgotten part of the, of the CIA triad, the Confidentiality, Integrity, Availability triad. In fact, with CMMC particularly, it's nearly silent on availability. Um, it's clear that the, the goal of CMMC is to protect your data from loss and manipulation. But really, availability is huge for most businesses, and I very strongly recommend factoring it in. Um, and it becomes, you know, your first step as a CISO, it's the first step that I would address, is understanding what the requirements are so that you can protect your information information systems to those. Um, one organization I was in particularly, um, the CISO listed out every major system they had. Uh, they had 300 different systems, and he prioritized them, one through 300, based on the crit criticality, the data processed, et cetera and came up with all the service level agreements for each and every one of those 300 systems. So does your organization have something like that in writing? Does your organization have something that actually is tantamount to a service level agreement um, for how, for uptime and, and uh, for the availability of, of your network systems? And if not, you should. Um, along with your business and mission drivers, you also have to understand what kind of data resides on your systems. If we're talking CMMC, of course, the main one is covered on classified information. That's the one everybody's talking about in DOD these days. Uh, but it's important to understand that there may be sensitive information uh, that, that includes other elements besides CUI, such as acquisition information, trade secrets, law enforcement information, et cetera. And um, by taking those into account early, you can avoid rework and having to go back and, and redo things later on and have actual true security of your network. Uh, one of the big things that we've seen actually is um, from mergers and acquisition. And we've seen a lot of problems. Um, we, we've, we've seen a lot of problems as far as um, folks doing mergers and acquisitions, and I'll get to that in a minute as well. Uh, along with your business and mission drivers, you must know what systems you have in place, and those can be broken out as uh, delivery channels, technologies, and connections. So you've got your servers, you have firewalls, you have routers, as you would expect. Uh, many of you have some type of mobile connectivity, such as bring your own device, that expands your threat, and with the trade-off being productivity. Um, but that threat has to be accounted for, and you have to have good mobile device management and figure out how you're going to limit your exposure with the addition of those devices. Um, and, and for CMMC, we, we strongly recommend, or, or any other sensitive type of information system, that you minimize the systems and the surface area that you have for processing uh, sensitive information such as CUI. The less surface area you have and the more confined that data is, then the less costly and the more effectively you're going to be able to, uh, to address security in it. And, and the way that the military does that is with their top secret systems, um, those access to those systems are few and far between. Um, so it's a, it, they're completely different networks and the way that we can address those in, um, in the realm of unclassified world is to segment those different types of systems and segment your operational technology systems and things like that from the rest of your, your organization. What I want to note, too, is a, a little bit of a foot stomp on third-party connections. And you should really think long and hard about what third-party connections that you might have or what third-party uh, personnel might have to your systems. And uh, a great story about that is that, you know, you're responsible for all of that. And there's two excellent examples of that. One is, you know, recently we had the Marriott breach, and it's called the Marriott breach, but what a lot of folks don't realize is that it was actually a vulnerability in the Starwood system. Marriott acquired Starwood, and in doing so, acquired Starwood's very long-standing cybersecurity vulnerability, which had been exploited with advanced persistent threat. But nobody calls it the Starwood breach, everyone calls it the Marriott breach, because once you take uh, acquisition of another company, you, their problems are now yours. And similarly, Target um, was broached um, about seven years ago and, um, and by all reports lost billions of dollars in reputation, reputational hit because a third-party contractor was fished and that ultimately led to 
um, the exploitation of their payment systems. So if you have DOD covered on classified information, then you know that you're going to have to, um, to, to address CMMC. And that applies at level one through five. If you're gonna do work with DOD at all, and if you have CUI, then you have to be at level three or above. Um, but there's also other ones that you have to figure out if they apply or if uh, that, that type of regulation is imminent, um, such as if you're processing PCI data, if you're doing HIPAA data, if you, are, uh, if you do business with any of the European co countries, then you might be uh, subject to GDPR, um, which includes such interesting uh, privacy types of considerations as the right to be forgotten. If someone um, unsubscribes, you know, making sure that you've wiped their data from your systems. So you have to also know, and you shouldn't deal with these different levels or different types of regulations uh, in a vacuum. You should collectively figure out how to approach all of the, all of the things that you're gonna be beholden to. Um, so at this point in time, you should fully understand your attack service. Um, you should, you, you know what you need to defend and who you're, and, 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 uh, and what your surface area is. But as Sun Tzu said, um, if you know the enemy and yourself, you need not fear the results of 100 battles. So you also need to know who you're defending it from. And um, that's step three. And uh, here's a list of people that make for a bad day. Um, and they range from, Organized criminals, terrorists, competitors with uh, covered on classified information, clearly. Um, nation states uh, uh, might be um, a threat. And then I also have other things like national disasters. You know, do you have your, uh, your data centers located in tornado or hurricane type places? Um, and, and to me, that, that is a, just as much of a um, threat as uh, an individual person is. Um, so, you need to know and understand who might be trying to come after you. And if you want to get really froggy, then you can um, take a look at the MITRE ATT&CK framework, um, which is pretty cool. It shows all the different types of exploits and who might be doing it. And I've been working with, uh, with some folks um, with Chertoff Group uh, around that. They, they have a pretty good, um, a pretty good program around um, taking a look at the MITRE ATT&CK framework and and, and understanding who is going to be interested in what information or what who might be interested in disrupting your systems. Um, the attack vectors that those bad actors take range from you know credential theft, ransomware is is clearly a big uh, consideration uh, now, and it's an easy one, and uh, folks are able to cash in. There's multiple different variations of those. Um, one of my favorites is that there's um, a, a ransomware exploit where if you've been subjected to ransomware, you go to a site that is set up to look as though it's going to help you uh, with unencrypting your files from ransomware. And when you employ it, it actually encrypts it again. And now they also ask for a, uh, uh, some type of ransom from you in order to get access to your files. So you've got double encrypted files at that point. Um, we see web skimming, crypto jacking, um, and then also uh, social engineering is always a great one, uh, including uh, phishing and uh, vishing and, and help desks are, are particularly uh, good targets for those. And, and we find that most places that we do social engineering um, uh, types of engagements at that we're able to, to get in most of the time. Uh, number four is um, solidifying executive buy-in. And this is an interesting one because I used to actually have this as number one, uh, number one or number two, but that's actually a, a lazy way of doing it and it doesn't work. Um, what you have to do is it's your job as an information security employee, as an information security professional, to be able to articulate to your leadership what the risks are in their language in a way that makes them want to, or makes them understand that it's important. And I think a lot of folks start with that and they say, well, I don't have executive buy-in, so 
I'm just going to be unsuccessful. And what I found is that you have to approach it the opposite way. You have to do your homework. You have to understand if you do your business impact analysis and you come to the table with a well-established plan and a well-established risk analysis of what could happen and what your threats and vulnerabilities are, then, um, then you can articulate that to your, to your uh, C-level folks, then you're far more likely to get buy-in at that point. But it's a failure to just sit back and hope that you get somebody in to your CEO position that gets it. You have to make them get it. And so at this point, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Dave, uh, who's gonna take us uh, through the next three um, steps. All right, thank you, uh, Cliff. Uh, just stay on this slide for just a moment here. So we're, we're at the point of selecting the appropriate framework and controls, and I know we're talking about uh, CMMC on this uh, webinar, but uh, you know, for uh, but for, for many defense contractors, though, the DFARS regulation and CMMC might not be the only regulation or framework uh, that you're required to be under, um, because some companies might have multiple regulations based on the different industries or verticals or markets that they that they work in. Sometimes, you know, you may only be 25% of your business is related to DOD, um, but you may also do state and local work or in the healthcare industry as well, or or energy sector or, or, or things like that. So and and you need to answer to those, and, and they may be using different frameworks. But here, here's the thing, though: if you have multiple regulations or frameworks that you have to be required to uh, answer to uh, in your industries, um, many of them have the same re requirements because they're all pretty much based off the same thing. Typically, the 800, uh, the, uh, the NIST 853 is kind of like the granddaddy. Uh, but anyway, they're all based off that in some form or fashion. Um, all of these frameworks can be mapped to each other from the NIST 853, NIST 800-171, CMMC, then you got your ISO 27000, your HIPAA, uh, PCI, which is payment card industry, uh, NERC SIP, which gets into to energy, um, but, but, but you name it, they're all mapped to each other. And, um, and if you do have this, uh, this, this requirement, use it to your advantage because you don't need to recreate the wheel for each regulation you may be under. Um, uh, if, if you don't have one specific framework you need to be under, maybe as a, as a company you decide, hey, we're going to use this one company-wide, and then you can uh, um, have appendices, so to speak, for all the different other pieces that have to meet, meet it. But, um, but when it's all said and done, they all look the same. And what I like to say is uh, security is security is security. Uh, because there's only so many ways that you can say, hey, you need to have an instant response plan, or hey, you need to use complex passwords, and you need to exercise least privilege or separation of duties. Um, it's all the same stuff. It's just kind of laid out a little differently, maybe a different acronym here and there, um, uh, and maybe a little different priority, but they're, they're all the same. Okay, so uh, if we go to the next slide, Cliff. So for the purpose of this webinar, uh, we're going to focus on the CMMC, uh, which is the, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. It's, it's uh, kind of replacing, in a way, um, uh, the NIST 800-171 re requirement. Originally within DFARS, as probably most of you know that are on this call, um, the requirement at that time was self-attestation. Um, and this requirement has been uh, in place since the end of 2017. How, however, uh, the main thrust for changing over to a certification model was because basically uh, organizations um, uh, were not getting compliant with this uh, either quick enough. Uh, they were pencil whipping that they were compliant uh, when they really weren't. Uh, and possibly they just really don't understand the seriousness or just really don't understand um, how cybersecurity works uh, within their, their business. So. So in comes the, the CMMC, and essentially it's a maturity model that is requiring DOD companies uh, to become certified at a level based upon the types of contracts and CUI data that they will have access to. Um, and, but, but, and what it comes down to is self-attestation at this point, or in the, and pretty soon, I should say, uh, will no longer suffice. Um, uh, but really what's going to happen is, so you as a company, um, besides the self-attestation, which is no longer going to be there, but you need to have a cybersecurity program in place. You need to have it best on best practices and prove that it is working. That's where the maturity piece comes from. And um, But if we open up the, the, the framework, and we're not going to get into details in, in this call here, but um, 
it, it's really not rocket science um, when it comes down to it. Um, CMMC is based on five levels of uh, security controls or what they call practices. And with level three kind of be in the sweet spot for a lot of companies just because it's incorporating the 110 controls out of the NIST 800-171 with uh, about 20 more uh, controls. Um, there's a lot of companies that will be in level one, which is uh, uh, 17 practices. Uh, it's very basic. In my opinion, if you as a company or if you're trying to become a secure company, and trying to do what's what's best for your company, I would still shoot for level three, even if your contracts are saying you need to be level one. Um, level three is your best practices. Uh, it's going to protect your your company the, the best way. And and really, there isn't anything in there you shouldn't be doing. Um, go ahead, Cliff. If you go to the next slide. Um, okay, so this is just another view of the uh, of the steps of, of the different levels of CMMC. Um, uh, you know, one thing about level one is it, it, it doesn't even require uh, documentation, which um, is kind of frustrating to me because as a, as a security pro professional, um, uh, you know, you might be doing all kinds of great things, but if it, if it isn't documented, it doesn't exist. And so that's really why I personally, you know, going to level, level three, that's the best bang for your buck as an organization. And, and trying to get better across the board. Plus all of the other security frameworks are gonna be very similar to level three to begin with, um, if, if, if you have those requirements. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so now we're getting into the section of, okay, so we, we have a framework, we have, uh, you know, we, we know what we're defending. Um, uh, hey, we might have somebody responsible for this all, all already, but now we need to understand where uh, where we stand as an organization. And in, in order to get to where you need to be, uh, you need to know where you are. And so this is where gap assessment comes in, into play. Um, um, I think, uh, go ahead, next slide, uh, Cliff. So as part of a gap assessment, so you're, you're reviewing the security controls um, uh, to try to get a true measure of where you stand. Now, some, some organizations, they come and say, yeah, I mean, we don't have anything. And uh, that makes a gap assessment kind of easy. But some, some companies have, you know, some things here and there, some disparate processes, policies, you know, they've done some things over time. Uh, they got some technical controls in place, but they're not really sure where they stand. And, and the purpose of, you know, really getting a gap assessment in there is to understand, um, you know, what you already have in place. Cause, cause you don't want to, uh, Kind of reinvent the wheel and start spinning your your wheels to try to do things that you might already have there. Um, but um, my recommendation is, you know, do a quick self assessment internally if you can, but then bring in some experts. And and here here's why. Uh, when you perform an internal assessment, especially folks that have been there for a long time, um, uh, there can be an unintentional bias where uh, you know you think that um, uh, certain things are in place, um, but maybe not fully, maybe some folks are afraid to really say what the, what the real answer is because you know they don't want to be exposed, for example, uh, because they might've been saying this entire time they've been doing that. Um, sometimes controls themselves or those practices are not clearly stated. And um, so a full understanding of what is being asked for is hard to ascertain for someone who may not be familiar with the regulation or, or security con controls. Because uh, a lot of them can be very vague and when it's and, and when it's vague, and you may not have someone with experience, be, be, you know, with, with those controls, uh, they they may not know the full understanding of what is needed there. Uh, a third party assessor, uh, like Matt Security, I'll just put a little plug in there, um, will bring an unbiased view to your environment. Um, and we have you know expert level of understanding of the controls. Uh, a third party assessor won't be afraid to tell you that your baby is ugly. Um, uh, but, you know, in the long run, but also provide a ch much cheaper alternative to performing it internally and using up the time and effort of your employees. Um, a third party can help develop the plan of actions and milestones, which is also called a POAM, uh, for managing the risks and developing the roadmaps for moving forward that meet the requirements. So, you know, so we, so we have the uh, requirements in place. We're talking about, so we're just saying CMMC here and uh, we've done a gap assessment, so we're starting to understand where we need to go. Um, and if you notice everything that Cliff and I have said so far, 
we haven't really gotten into anything technical. Um, and that's because uh, we, we haven't even gotten into technical controls yet. We're just trying to create the cybersecurity program, right? So, um, so within CMMC, uh, just go to a couple little details here. Um, you, you need to be able to validate the security controls that you have in place. Um, and when you do that, you, you need to have artifacts. And artifacts are, are, are required from you know, your policies, your procedures, uh, those technical controls. Uh, but those pre procedures need to also be uh, re re repeatable. And so the part about being ma mature or having a, a, a mature program is, hey, we have an incident response program. We just didn't put it together last week and have never used it. Or we, we have a change management policy um, and we have a change management pr pr procedure. We've been using it for the last two or three years. And, and here's evidence of, of how we've gone through through the entire uh, process over time, and, and we've we've gotten it better. So that's what they're looking for. It's showing the showing that that, that evidence. Also, the evidence of technical controls in place. You know, uh, you know, you, you say you have a password policy. What is that policy set to within your systems? You know, you, you say that you're supposed to have it so many characters long, and uh, you know, use complex passwords, and and um, uh, and and you can only use the last ten. Or, or, or you can't use the last 10 passwords, well, is that actually set? You know, and so you'd be able to show, show that evidence uh, for those systems. So um, go to the next slide, Cliff. And, and so this slide here gets into how um, match security would perform a, a gap assessment for your organization. So, um, you know, step one is uh, getting into, you know, understanding the controls. You know, is it CMMC level three? Is it one, four, five, two? Um, but just understanding which level you're, you're, you're supposed to be at. Um, but then we get into um, the interviews and the artifacts section where, um, uh, you know, interviews with the stakeholders uh, that are completed, you know, on site or through, through a remote way, just to really understand what uh, your, your environment and really get, get to know you well. Um, of course, reviewing all those artifacts for, for validation. Are you doing the things that you say that, that you're, you're doing? Um, as I, you know, I mentioned a little bit ago, a lot, a lot of folks, you know, are doing great things, but nothing's documented. And when it's not documented, you can't prove it or, you know, it, it doesn't really it, it exist. So that's why things have to be documented. Um, so after we, you know, we've, we've gone through the interviews, uh, we've reviewed the controls with the artifacts, then now we start identifying the gaps uh, with the, within each, each control. And so, you know, outside of this um, uh, uh, finding, then, then we wrap a risk rating around it of a you know high, moderate, or low, um, uh, and also with a, a potential level of effort. One of the things that we really try to get to know with our clients is their environment. Uh, a level of effort, for example, is completely different for a company of ten people than it is for a company of a thousand or five thousand people, depending on on what the um, what the finding is. And so you know, understanding that and saying, hey, you know, this uh, would be a very high effort for you as a company because you're only 20 people, you don't have an IT person in place, you, you, you don't have this or that, uh, so that might take a lot of effort. However, you know, a company of 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, you know, will probably have those folks in place. And so that might be a lower um, uh, level of effort. But, uh, but besides that, with the risk rating, you know, we also provide a detailed recommendation remediation strategy. Um, we just don't give you, it's like, hey, this is a finding, uh, you need to have a policy. Well, you know, we, we give you the reasons why. Why is that important? You know, you, you can know the, the, the what all day long, but, but you also need to know the why. Um, why is that important? Um, and then uh, when, when we provide your report, it gets into executive summary, uh, high level detail for, 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 for the executive level, and then a detailed technical report. Also, another deliverable you get into is a POEM, that plan of actions and milestones I was referring to. Uh, basically, this is a spreadsheet of all the findings um, uh, from the gap assessment to support project management. And, and, and many times, this uh, uh, POEM can also be considered a risk register in some in industries. Um, it, it's just a, you know, a, a living document of all of the risk and vulnerabilities found within the environment and, and how they're being managed from uh, discovery till the end. Um, then you get into your system security plan or your SSP. And this is, um, uh, I, I, I have a little different uh, approach to this than what you might see on NIST's website where they have a template. Um, I personally think that is uh, junk. Uh, 
because I think a, a system security plan needs to describe how controls are implemented in a narrative form uh, throughout your information system. Uh, uh, you know, you could do it way, way, way they have it out there where you kind of list each control itself and and answer to it. But the problem with that is because so many of these controls uh, 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 combine with, with each other um, throughout all the control families, um, it can be very hard for someone who doesn't understand uh, those controls to really understand what's going on in your environment. So making it in a more narrative form is, is in my opinion, a lot easier for, um, for the or organization to explain to others how system security um, is, is being run through, throughout the organization. Uh, but then you get into the next part is the compliance log or compliance tracking log. And this is tracks all the controls and their associated artifacts. So each, each control should have an artifact of some sort. And so this is uh, where you can track. And so when you have that, that CMMC audit, that, that assessor coming out to certify you, you have everything right there for them ready to go. Because um, one of the last things that you want to don't want to do when you get to the point of being certified, whenever that's going to happen in the next six months, a year, two years, three years, is scrambling to try to find everything. Have everything in one place, a one-stop shop, and it's going to make it a whole lot easier on you, a whole lot easier on the assessor, and um, uh, you know, and, 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 and hopefully the ability to get certified where you need to be. Um, so that's all I had there. Um, uh, Cliff, I, I think we can go on to the next slide. Right. So, and so just, just a little re review of, you know, when it comes to the gap assessment, you know, uh, the, the, the stakeholder collaboration is key because um, whether you're doing it internally or having a third party come in to, to do this, you need to confirm the scope. What, what is the scope of our gap here? Um, uh, you know, and identifying those key personnel to make sure they're all on board um, and that they're there to an answer the questions. And, and it, it, it gets into that ownership as Cliff was talking about a moment ago. Um, and then, um, but but there does need to be that you know that that primary POC that that is going to be the, the one who's going to be the champion of it for for your organization. Um, it, it can't be you know other duties as assigned, so to speak. You know, someone needs to be the champion here. Uh, but but also setting those dates and milestones is is key because if 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 you don't have those in place, you know this stuff will sit out there forever. Um, and, and and I've seen a lot. You know, s someone does a gap assessment, they get their get their POAM. Okay, and a year later, nothing's been been done because they don't, um, you know, they they haven't said anything, and, and internally they don't have any milestones, and they don't have anyone uh, championing this. So, um, so definitely get that uh, stakeholder uh, buy-in. All right, Cliff. And then, okay, so now we get into the uh, the remediation of the findings, and so. Um, uh, you know, so you're going to get your your your, your POAM, and you're going to have um, those those items on the POAM. As I said, in some industries, it's called a risk register, and um, but you know, a POAM is basically used to assist in identifying, assessing, uh, prioritizing, and monitoring the progress of of your efforts to correct those weaknesses and deficiencies and vulnerabilities in your information system. And um, but what it really does also is help to facilitate a disciplined and structured approach to mitigating risk. Um, and, it, and it also maintains those recommendations for remediation. Um, uh, and so you, you, you see on the slide there, it says remediate highest risk first when feasible, because there, this is, gets into what's the prioritization for the company, what makes sense for the company, because sometimes you may have a very high risk, but the effort is going to be really high, and it's going to take a long time to get it done. Um, so. You may want to, of course, start working on that, but there also could, could, could be this lower hanging fruit that can also be knocked off too. So, um, you know, sometimes those those little wins help to get everything started uh, because if you start trying to do something really big to begin with, um, you may lose folks and it, it it might be difficult to really push that boulder up, up the hill. So that's where you get into this prioritizing and creating a roadmap of understanding, okay, this these are the our findings, this is what needs to be done, what makes sense, you know, and how can we prioritize this uh, throughout, um, you know, throughout a year? Because um, it may take that long uh, for for the for the company to uh, remediate those those risks. So you know, and but but a poem is also a 
part of your continuous monitoring strategy. And Cliff's going to talk about that here in the next slide. But a continuous monitoring strategy is really uh, continuously tracks changes to your systems um, that may affect security controls um, throughout this life cycle and also reassessing those controls uh, and effectiveness uh, throughout throughout the life cycle. And so it, it's, it's not just uh, technical, but it also gets into process and and the people. And so um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Cliff now for the uh, for the rest of the way. You're, you're muted, Cliff, I believe. <laughs> All right. That's the way my wife likes it most of the time is me muted. Um, <laughs> so I think I'm back now. Uh, so the last step of this is the conduct continuous monitoring. And, uh, you know, cybersecurity, like most other, like all other types of security, isn't just a point in time um, type situation. You have to continually uh, assess it. You have emerging tactics, techniques, and procedures, um, and emerging threats at all times. So you have to be able to conduct continuous monitoring. And, and one of the best ways to do that is um, to have some type of SOC, Security Operations Center, SOC as a service, and the, the key elements of uh, Security Operations Center are shown here, um, and they include, uh, you know, upper right asset discovery. You know, really what's amazing is that of all the clients that I've ever worked with, all the different places I've ever worked with, if you ask somebody for their network diagram, um, most of the time you're going to get blank stares. Most of the time you're going to get, you know, hey, go see so-and-so over at North Lab, go see so-and-so over here, go and see somebody over there. And, um, and, and it's, really, uh, it's really amazing how most people don't even really know what's on their network. And what ends up happening is, is that I know that when we come in as a SOC as a service, uh, within like the very first day is usually an exceptionally enlightening moment uh, and, and a um, physically, physically and emotionally painful moment as we kind of illuminate, hey, did you know that this was on your network? Did you know that that was on your network? And so understanding that if you don't know what, what's there, then, then, you know, that's all part of the, the steps two and three that I was talking about before. Um, but also knowing what's being added to your network in real time, making sure that you're combating, you know, folks adding wireless access points or whatever the case might be. So as the discovery is a huge, huge part of your uh, security operations. Uh, next is vulnerability assessment and doing continuous monitoring, including, um, you know, vector attack identification and using some type of system or some type of tool that is continuously updating for um, new types of, um, new types of um, threats um, and, and is scanning for those. Uh, the next is threat detection. Um, host-based intrusion detection, uh, network intrusion detection, and, and everything else, and, and seeing things that are happening using threat intelligence feeds and file integrity monitoring, so you're able to see what's going on. Um, behavioral monitoring is always uh, very enlightening. You, um, I know that our SOC as a service, what we offer is, you know, that top 10 list of uh, the most problematic people and the most problematic devices on your network. So you can kind of get a feel for what normal looks like. And a lot of times, um, you know, while signature-based security, you know, has had its moments, um, really understanding what is anomalous on your network is, is what's most important. And, um, you know, similar to, you know, when I go through the gate at my parents' 55 and up community that they just moved into, um, you know, those folks know what is normal coming into the gate. So they see me, they recognize me, I'm a normal normal person that comes through every day, in a normal car that they see every day, and they, they see me as, as um, you know, when, when they see me more and more coming through the gate, they recognize, hey, they're associated with 21534 King Henry Avenue. Yep, those are the new folks who just moved in, um, as opposed to, hey, wait a minute, we've never had one of those trucks come through here before. That doesn't look like it's right. Um, being able to, to, to look at it from a behavioral perspective is very important. Um, your human security behavior assessment, that's basically phishing campaigns, targeting campaigns, teachable moments, um, sticky messaging um, is something that your security operations program should entail. 
And then um, security intelligence, which includes security incident event management, correlation. Um, if you're only looking at each log in its own, um, in a vacuum, then you don't get a chance to see that, hey, you know, there's a lot of traffic coming from um, different places that isn't meeting the threshold for throwing an alert maybe for that um, particular firewall. But you, you can, if you correlate the actions, you can figure, hey, something really sophisticated is going on here. Um, that is a tool. Um, and one of the things that I'll point out is that um, a, a lot of MSPs will try to be MSSPs, a lot of MSSPs will try to be MSPs. And for compliance, that might be okay. You know, the folks that do your computers uh, and hey, they do antivirus and that's all great and they maintain your firewalls and that's all well and good. Um, you know, and they might even check every box that DOD throws at you for, do you do this? Um, you know, it, it's really hard to be able to do both because an MSP's job is to get you access to all the data you need, to all the tools you need as a trusted user, whereas an MSSP looks at it from a completely different view. They look at it from keeping and denying access uh, in many cases from, uh, from uh, uh, different types of uh, the bad guys out there. So, um, so essentially, you know, you let the MSPs be MSPs, you let the MSSPs be the MSSPs. But that's if you want to take a security approach as opposed to a, a compliance approach. So essentially, here's the key takeaways. Uh, those are the, the eight steps uh, to, to building a winning cybersecurity program that, that, that we follow, that I would follow if I went in any organization. Um, a little bit about MAD Security. We were founded in 2010. Um, we provide CMMC prep services, SOC as a service penetration testing. Um, but really what we do, even more importantly than each individual product, is that our goal is to help you safeguard your business and bring you peace of mind. Our objective isn't to have you check the box. Every engagement that we go into when we engage clients, we try to do so from the perspective of, I'm a CISO, if, if this was my organization, here's what I would do. And we find that that allows us to help our clients and help our partners holistically as opposed to just CMMC or just um, conducting this area or element. We, we like to, um, we're, we're passionate about doing cybersecurity in general and safeguarding your business. CMMC is just one, one facet of that that we're incredibly, uh, incredibly knowledgeable on. And I think that wraps us up. Um, thank you very much for attending. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is pretty easy, cliff at madsecurity.com, and I've got my uh, cell phone there and everything else. Um, let's see. And I know that this is uh, um, interesting. Let me see. I don't know if I can take questions or not. Uh, let me see here. Let's see, stop sharing. And I'll go back. Um, I'm happy to take questions if uh, if we have that capability to do so. This is the first WebEx that I've actually administered. I'll go ahead and uh, admit to that. So a little bit of a neophyte with respect to uh, to WebEx. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute or or I can try to unmute you and uh, let me know. I think you can actually raise your hand uh, or some other things. So Cliff, this is Pete Van Ness. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, so a question on uh, access to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. How would we go about looking at the MITRE ATT&CK framework? So, um, so it's available for free online, which is good. They're an FFRDC, of course. So, um, so I actually just um, just had that up and was looking at it. But they, um, what I can do is share screen again. Um, MITRE ATT&CK. Here we go. Um, and uh, I'll share screen. Uh, 
There we go. All right, so I think I'm sharing screen three here. So this is the um, MITRE ATT&CK uh, matrix for enterprise. And so these are the different ways. What they've done is they, they've um, organized it along, um, you know, initial access. And they talk about the different elements that include, you know, drive-by compromise, phishing, replication through removable media, et cetera. All these different ways that you could gain initial access. And then execution is the next one. Persistence is the next step in uh, maturity as far as getting access into your um, into your uh, system through privileged escalation. And these are the different elements, and you can click on each of these to see, you know, group policy modification is a good one. So they say, you know, adversaries, adversaries may modify GPOs. And for those of you, you know, who, who use GPO, whether it's in Office 365 or Active Directory or whatever, um, you know, know how important it is to, to lock down your, your, your GPOs um, and keep your policies set. But, um, but this will, will go through um, how folks would, how the attacker would do that. And so what I like about this is that in cybersecurity, as in all other types of security, offense informs defense, right? You, you, as, as a defender, you have to adapt to the offender. And so I think they've done a really nice job of coming up and, and, and characterizing these um, the, the maturity as you go through credential access discovery, lateral movement, collection, command and control, you know, all the way through to impact, um, and each of these different types of exploits that they use. So, you know, depending upon how sophisticated you want to be in your defense, you know, you would go through each of these, and that actually could be, you know, an engagement that someone could come in and do, you know, with you and for you. Um, you know, that would be similar to, you know, a CMMC engagement or other type of control engagement. But, but looking at it purely from the perspective of how attackers try to get in, which is kind of nice. Does that, uh, does that answer? I'll assume yes. Sorry, I changed. I couldn't find the mute <laughs> button. No, that was good. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions?